idiosyncratic, iconic and unique. Boasting the Queen of England as one of its loyal supporters, it's a race so surreal it even features its own fun fact. Famous for its undulating track and a corner so sharp that it warrants its own name. It's the truest test of any horse. To win a race like this, you need power, stamina and speed. And for many... It's the greatest flat race in the world. It's the Derby. Located just south of London in the heart of Surrey, one of England's leafiest counties, Epsom is famous for two things, salts and horse racing. Blessed with rolling countryside, its esteemed race course can be found sitting proudly up on the downs. And it's here that Britain's richest and most prestigious races run, the Derby. The name may have been borrowed by several countries around the world, but it is the Epsom version that remains the most iconic and significant. It was first run over 200 years ago, in fact, 1780. So understandably, it's got a lot of history. Well, it came about at a party that was given by Lord Derby at his house, the Oaks. They decided that they'd have this one-off race they didn't have a name for it, uh, so they spun a coin, and it was between Sir Charles Bunbury and uh, Lord Derby, whose house it was. They spun the coin, it became the Derby Stakes, and as fate would have its way, Sir Charles Bunbury had the first winner, who was Diomed. The history of it is fantastic. How the royal family have come. The Queen first came here in 1948 when she was 22 and uh, she's been here every year, apart from the two years. She went to the celebration of the D-Day landings in Normandy. She hasn't won the Derby. She's won all the other classics. And she's always here, she's leaning over the rail with her fist up to go. <laughs> the track itself tells its own story, a rolling left-handed circuit with a downhill home straight that's the fastest in the world. It's something you just cannot appreciate just by watching a race here on, on TV, just the undulations and the challenge that this course faces over its sort of mile and a half. It's not a circuit, it's a horseshoe-shaped course. And you climb the equivalent of 150 feet. We, we liken it, it's apparently it's the height of Nelson's Column from the start of the derby to the point around the seven furlong pole at the top of the hill. So it's all on the climb. So then you encounter Tatton Corner and the hill, which again is, is downhill, it falls away about 70, 80 feet from the top of the hill to the bottom. And then you, then you get to this home straight and you've got a, a unique feature again, a cambered home straight. This, the side we're standing on is about six feet higher than the, the bottom of the course. It falls away to the inside, which is just a, yet another challenge for the horses that race here to, to cope with. Quite frankly, if you, if you went to, I think, to any governing body, including British racing authorities now, with a design for, for this race course, you, you, you wouldn't get approval for it. It just doesn't tick any of the boxes. But it's, it, it, that's, it's, it's uniqueness, it's, it's, it's individuality, and the challenge that it poses all, all add to why the, the Investec Derby is the race that it is, the greatest flat race in the world. One of the main reasons for the popularity of this event is its appeal from royalty to Romany. The hill is still the heart of the Derby, where in the early years the travelling community would rock up in their colourful caravans and carts, selling their goods and services. The land we're on here is governed by an Act of Parliament, the Epsom and Walton Downs Act. And what that gives to the public is the right on every day of the year to go onto the downs here at Epsom, to the middle of the course, for what's called air and exercise, completely free of charge. So this is not only a great race, but it's a great free race in that, in that tens of thousands of people can go out onto the middle completely free of charge under the rights enshrined in this Act of Parliament. It's well documented that Queen Elizabeth II is one of the Derby's most loyal followers and that her passion for horses was formed at an early age. Given her first thoroughbred as a wedding present by the Aga Khan in 1949, her longevity as a racehorse owner now spans eight decades. The Queen's interest in racing is not just as a spectator She's been breeding horses for that long, so she's with some lines on the fourth or fifth or sixth generation. I think the Queen appreciates so much what it takes to win here. 
My father trained for the Queen right from the beginning, so always in April the Queen would visit all of her trainers and still does to see the horses. And so Dad would say, um, right, tomorrow morning you need to be in your, in your best kit. And I would never really know why. It didn't matter how many years this happened, I'd still forget and then be rather shocked when the Queen turned up for breakfast. And I do remember one year running into, uh, into the kitchen and wondering why we weren't having breakfast in the kitchen and being told, oh no, they're in the dining room. And I went shooting into the dining room in my socks and my jumpers and my rugby shirt. And there was the Queen sitting at the head of the table. So I was a bit surprised. <laughs> I should know better, but I was a bit surprised. In 1992, the Queen opened a new stand at Epsom Downs named in her honour. This year, in recognition of her 90th birthday celebrations, for the first time, she'll be presenting the trophy. Derby Day nearly always falls very close to the Queen's official birthday. So it tends to go Derby Day one weekend, followed by Trooping the Colour the next weekend, followed straight on that by Royal Ascot. So for the Queen, it's sort of two weeks immersed in, in racing as well as her, all of her official duties. Um, and it's very special and this year, for the first time, the Queen presented the trophy for, for the Derby, and that's a, that's a big deal too, to actually, you know, agree. Her, her name was um, used as part of the Coronation Cup title as well, so it, it's very much been marked as, as a special day in the 90th birthday celebrations. As part of these commemorations, sculptor Charlie Langton is working on a bronzed horse and foal that the Queen will unveil later this year. Epsom was the breeding ground for his success, as it was six years ago that he was bestowed the privilege of creating the first ever perpetual Derby trophy. Tell me a little bit about the, the horse and foal then behind you, that that's something special for the Queen's birthday. The idea was basically to uh, commission something that really highlighted the Queen's love of racing and her, you know, particular her love of breeding and her involvement with the sport for so long. Um, and so it was thought that a mare and foal would, would sort of sum that connection up in the best way. Because actually she's quite unique in that she's obviously had lots of successful race sources over the years, but she breeds most of them, doesn't she? I think it's her real, you know, it's her real passion as it is, you know, racing is a real passion for lots of people. When she goes to Sandringham and sees her mares and foals that, you know, that's a time which is just for her. So we, we really wanted to create something that reflected that, that passion. So Charlie, the Investec Derby Trophy then, which you made in 2010, how did it all come about? Because it's very different, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that was that was Investec's sort of starting point, really, was that they didn't want it to be a cup or a plate or anything sort of normal looking. And then actually, when you start looking into the race, you think there's there's so much you can do with it, you know. And the whole design is, is based around the course itself, because it's, it's such a unique course, and that's what makes the Derby so special. And back in 2010, you were a relative sort of up and coming sculptor, not perhaps as well known as you are now. It must have been um, a big deal for you and, and I guess your future as well. Yeah, it was a huge, it was a huge, you know, boost for me. It was my first, you know, really big public commission, to be honest. Um, and it's been a, it's been a great platform for me to move on from. There was a lot of talking about it beforehand and because it was a competition, you know, there were three or four of us up for it in the first place. So there was, there was quite a lot of stuff to get through even before I could start the process. So I think eventually I started it in January and then it was unveiled at the first Derby trial at Epsom in April. So, you know, there really wasn't long to, uh, to, to sort of muck around with it. You know, I had to really crack on with it. And this year the Queen's going to be presenting it. That's something else as well. Yeah, that's amazing. I can't wait to, can't wait to see her presenting it. You know, just, just be nice if she was receiving it rather than presenting it, you know, maybe, maybe next year. Well, this is where the trophy lives here at Epsom Racecourse and it's waiting to be awarded to the 2016 winner by Queen Elizabeth II. Coming up after the break, we'll take a walk through memory lane with a couple of names who are already lucky enough to be on this trophy. The Derby meeting is one of Britain's treasured institutions regarded as the blue ribbon of turf racing. Which is why I've come to Curlington Studs near Oxford to meet a family whose name is synonymous with the great race. One of just two people have bred, owned and trained two Derby winners. Arthur Budget won the race in 1969 and 1973 with Blakeney and Morstan respectively. Both were bred from the same mare, Windmill Girl. Arthur's legacy now spans two generations and son Chris has fond memories of growing up during his father's glory days. 
So tell me, what do you remember about those two Derby days? So many stories about Morstan winning the Derby, but the, one of the fun things was that uh, we, we were late and we were passed by this cavalcade uh, with lots of police outriders and it was Ted Heath and he was going straight down the other side of the road and everything was being pushed out of the way so my dad just pulled in behind him and we went the whole way to Epsom and uh, we were all, I was cringing in the back actually saying Dad do you think you'll pull in? He said that they can't stop because they're with the Prime Minister they cannot stop so we'll just follow them. Obviously your father had won those two derbies and it was a great day out. When did you um, become proud of his achievements? That's an easy one. You were proud of the moment it happened. You knew what, what, what the achievement was even at that age, you know, and, and really did. Being the son of a double derby winning trainer, owner, breeder, there must have been quite a lot of expectation on you when you decided to go into the industry. As a son, I mean, you know, I, I always say to people, don't ever be successful if you're going to have children because it's a hell of a legacy to leave your son. I can never emulate him, you know, I know that. My dad just asked me actually if I take over training and I really didn't know enough about it. And I said I wouldn't do that and then he just said would I get involved in the breeding side. You know, I've got enormous respect for my dad, so I just said I didn't actually ever plan on doing it. I just said, yeah, I will. But because I don't know much about horses per se, I've got to go and work abroad because everyone in England knows me and would expect me to know everything about it. And I'd never learned properly. So I went and worked in France, Australia, America. And whilst I was away, um, I became intrigued by it. I just did it to please my dad, actually. I had no intention of doing it. And here I am 40 years later. You've had your own success with the Derby as well? We, we do what's called pin hooking, which is buying young foals and selling them on as yearlings and we actually pin hooked Sir Percy. He was a well-bred horse, he was bred to do the Derby distance, which is something that I think, you know, a lot of people race, race horses in the Derby that aren't bred to do the distance, and invariably they fail. You know, it is the toughest test of a horse, but he was bred to do it, he was a beautifully balanced little horse. And he, yeah, it was great, he had a lovely temperament. Did we think he was going to win the Derby? No, absolutely not, but we knew he was a nice horse. Chris's nephew Charlie has been established for the last year at Kirtlington Park Stud on the grounds where his grandfather Arthur grew up. Got a lot of history as a, an estate as well, with thoroughbreds particularly. Yes, no, exactly, that's why I wanted to keep the Kirtlington in, because it was part of the farm stud when my grandfather had it, and I wanted to keep the Kirtlington name as well, I and mean, the history does mean a vast amount to me. Um, it's why I'm probably doing it, actually, it's certainly why I'm in the game now. And your grandfather, he didn't train here, he, but he this was his childhood home, and did he, he had he bred horses here? He did, you know, it's very much, this is where his decent mares would come back to, it's where Wimble Girl was, and where Morse and Blakeney were both reared. So, yeah, this is where it all happened, really, to get to where he got to. So, hoping to breed more Derby winners here? It's a complete dream, but I realise now how difficult it is. The more I learn, the more I realise how brilliant he was, how lucky to an extent he was as well, which he always appreciated. Charlie should have been my dad's son because he'd have taken over the training side just like that. And Charlie wanted to train, but the problem is he came into the game a little bit too late. You know, we discussed it and he's always wanted to be involved and so we just said, why not get involved in the breeding side? And he will be phenomenally successful. He knows horses for a start. He's a nice guy and um, he's on some of the best land in England. We're now just 50 minutes from Kirtlington. And this is where Arthur trained, Whatcom House, which is now under the care of another Derby winning trainer, Paul Cole. I think we arrived in 86 and kicked off in 87, and I decided that um, I could come in here and sell a bit off and fiddle around, or I could bring somebody in with me. And I decided to ask Prince Fyre and come in and just upgrade it with, with investment, which is what we did, put the swimming pool in, built new yards, and did anything we could that would help horses to win races. Is there much history from the time that Arthur was here? Any signs of his training and his successes at all? Well, his successes speak for themselves. He's obviously a natural horseman and, um, you know, he did wonderfully well in, in, from no massive foreign investment or anything. He did wonderfully well with the tools he was given. There must be something about Whatcom, do you think, that what makes it such a great training base? Well, this is downland, whereas Newmarket's heathland. It's more gradients. The turf is basically, you could call it virgin turf. I mean, the sponge up there in the winter, you wouldn't know that, in the summer rather, you wouldn't know that it was dry everywhere else. 
springiness comes in there, which you, you can't believe. So keeping horses sound is one of the tricks of the trade. So the gallops help towards that. If you can't train them here, you can't train them anywhere. Paul Cole's most notable achievements came in the early 90s. He claimed the St. Ledger with Snurge, the first million pound horse, before winning the Derby with Generous in 1991. How hard is it to train a Derby winner? What are the elements you need? If you've got the best horse, it's easy. <laughs> yeah. Generous is the best horse. In fact, sometimes it's easier to win a Derby if you've got the best horse than it is to win a handicap with a bad horse. If you're lucky enough to have a talented horse, you've just got to try and get things right uh, and then hope for the best. So it's a race that influences generations as well as creates history. Coming up next, we're going to be meeting some of the characters and meeting some of the leading contenders in this year's Epsom Derby. This month on Winning Post, we've been looking at the history of the Derby and Paul Cole's winning horse, Generous, as a statue of him standing proudly at the entrance to Epsom Downs. Another family that have enjoyed huge success in the race is the O'Briens. Father Aidan has trained five winners of the race. Two of them have been ridden by his jockey son, Joseph. And yet again, they've sent over a hugely strong team of horses for this year's race from Ireland. Their stable is responsible for five of this year's 16 runners, including the undefeated US Army Ranger, ridden by two-time derby winner Ryan Moore, who, according to the bookmakers, is their big hope. Physically, we think he's very fit, we think he's well, uh, everything has went well with him and uh, hopefully now on the day that mentally he will, he will be able to hold it together because he is obviously a little bit of a baby, you know, so um, that'll, be the, that'll be a little bit of the, of the worrying thing, but um, we're very happy with his work, uh, everything is right with him, he's, like, so far everything has went uh, very well. Obviously we would be delighted if, if uh, the horses could, could run big races, if any of them wins we'll, we'll be over the moon. Like obviously if, if US Army Ranger gets it together on the day, like it would be incredibly special, but you never, we, we just hope that they, they run good races and, uh, and um, they come out of the race as well and uh, we know where we're going the, the next time uh, with them, you know, so we're looking forward to Saturday. It took jockey Frankie de Tori 15 attempts before he finally landed the derby in 2007 on Authorised and another eight years before his second win on Golden Horn. The fans' favourite is looking to back that up this year on Wings of Desire. I guess, you know, football's got the World Cup, Formula One's got the Monaco Grand Prix and uh, the Epsom derby is, uh, is the best we can offer. You know, it's, it's got everything. It's got suspense, it's got... Um, Carnival fever, uh, racing passionate, a bit of fashion, a bit of everything, and uh, you know, it's, it's unique. And how much would you like to be uh, receiving the, the trophy from the Queen? Yeah, I'd love to because uh, all, also my parents are here as well, and uh, um, you know, uh, it'd be a dream come true. The 1979 Derby attracted a crowd of 500,000 and although these days it's a more condensed event with attendance figures in the region of 100,000, the fashionistas were still out in force. The purse back in 1780 was $1,500. This year it's the richest race ever held in Britain worth just under 2 million with the winning Colts value estimated to rocket by a further $40 million. The Queen's arrival heralded the start of the long-awaited 237th running and the big question on everyone's lips was which horse and jockey would get the royal seal of approval. The Queen's a breeder, she's fascinated in the pedigrees of each horse and I think testament to the Queen's interest is the fact that she reads the racing post from cover to cover every single day. So with that depth of knowledge that you build on a daily basis plus you're a breeder and you see the outcome of what you've produced and how you might breed to a stallion whose offspring have temperamental issues or like soft ground. The Queen's just building all that knowledge which just makes her a consummate professional on the subject. If you want to find out more about Queen Elizabeth II's unwavering passion for horse breeding then go to CNN.com. The race saw Aidan O'Brien's US Army Ranger and Frankie Dottori on Wings of Desire held up in the opening stages. Caught towards the outside, Wings of Desire, US Army Ranger. Red Burden getting a nice seam right up the inside rail. Port Douglas is taken on by Cloth of Stars. Now joining in down the outside is Idaho. Harzan comes next. Red Burden ran out of room on the inside. Right down the outside, Wings of Desire and US Army Ranger. Idaho strike cap and Harzan for the first to go for home. Of 
Frankie de Tori had to settle for fourth place in the end, with Aidan O'Brien's US Army Ranger narrowly missing out to Harzand, a last minute addition to the lineup. An injury scare in the morning of the race didn't stop him and jockey Pat Smullen claiming their first victory, receiving the trophy for the first time from Queen Elizabeth II herself. Well, Charlie, you made the trophy in 2010 and lots of famous people have handed it out in the time since then, but I guess um, this year extra special. Yeah, absolutely. Incredible. It's been an amazing day and to see Her Majesty present it just now is just incredible. It's the most amazing uh, flat race in the world and uh, to have it topped off by it being presented by the Queen is, you know, you can't really beat that. So, chapter bits. Well, congratulations to Dermot Weld and all the connections of Harzand. It was a wonderful story and yet another piece of history for this famous race with the Queen presenting the trophy for the first time. Hopefully she'll be back next year with a possible runner. But that's it from Epsom from us next month on Winning Post. We'll be looking at racing heartlands around the world from the bluegrass of Lexington to what they call the capital of the horse in Chantilly in France. We'll see you then.